Good morning. I know I'm real excited to be here, especially where I get to talk about some of my favorite topics, which is Node and APIs, and how that's really powering the digital world that we live in today. And the world, right, as we all know it, is changing by the second. It's constantly evolving. And that's all powered through technology advancements that are happening out there. And we as end users are only adding to the fire. We want it, we want more, we want it easier, and we want it faster. So to provide that, I'm just going to do a quick example. Right? Imagine that we, well, something that we all do on a regular basis, going out to a new restaurant for dinner. So uh, I, my wife and I live in a rural area, and we're going to a new restaurant downtown. So, simple questions. How do I get there? What am I going to order? And where to park? Simple things, I think they apply to a lot of different scenarios as well. So with that, the API economy in the world today and in our daily life, they provide us a number of different things that help us with that. The GPS within our car or our cell phones that help us get from point A to point B, well, I can figure out how to get to that restaurant. That first question solved. I can look, go ahead and look at the website's menu and understand what I might want to order in, ahead of time. Or I can go look at things like Yelp that provide that information. But I feel like there's, always, there's something more that we can need that can help better that overall experience that we have. So imagine, what if the restaurant exposed their menu via an API, and the application code would actually be able to pre-order the appetizer for you and have it arrive when I got there, based off of the GPS of my car. So it times there perfectly when I arrive. What if the city exposes a green parking API, where through that application, I can reserve a parking spot while driving to the restaurant? What if the automaker integrated with the home security API, where you could turn on the security cameras the minute you left the garage? And what if the TV providers exposed a programming guide API so that the application can record the basketball game or whatever you want as the user won't be in home in time uh, based on the geolocation of the car? Right? And the possibilities are really endless around those types of scenarios. And to really capture the benefits of the API economy, there's a number of different things that it affects. The first is the delightful experience. Well, for me as the end user, well, I had a wonderful experience. My meal was better. Uh, I got the appetizer waiting for me, and that, over, that, that felt real good. I, was a, not able, I didn't have to drive around for 10 minutes within my car looking for a spot in a crowded traffic area. Um, I didn't, and maybe not even 10 minutes walking from that parking spot to the restaurant itself. I felt safer with my kids at home because the moment I exited the garage, well, my security cameras uh, came on, and I didn't have to worry about forgetting or if things were not locked up in a proper way. And finally, right, I didn't have to rush home to turn on that Knicks game. Well, maybe that's a good thing, because uh, if you guys like the Knicks, they stink. And, you know, they don't have to worry about that, and I could watch the game, not get in trouble with my wife, and, you know, I've got it recorded for a later time. So all things that then made my life a lot better by all of that, by different APIs being exposed so that applications then can take advantage of that. I mean, there are other aspects as well. If we think about direct revenue for the restaurant itself, well, they have um, more appetizers being bought, so more money. Good recommendations from the, the end users because of the satisfaction that they had, so more folks coming, and return users as well. And certainly, you know, parking, the city gets additional revenue as well. You know, more parking lots are fully, fully utilized, less tra traffic on the streets for parking, less clogged, so making the overall downtown a better experience. And obviously, there's a lot of indirect revenue as well with things around Google and Nest and BMW, IFTT and others, where they can take advantage of all of the different APIs being exposed um, for applications that they build. Another quick example, um, is really around um, you know, a number of different things. One is Starbucks. If we think about what they've done, right, going fully digital, having a huge payments business, um, it's really transforming the way we do things. Just you know, a few weeks ago, I woke up, I was out of coffee um, in my house, so hey, not a problem. There, there's a number of different coffee uh, stores on my way to, way to the office. 
Now, there's three all in one particular area, and I chose Starbucks for a very simple reason. Not because the coffee was better, um, because it's actually my least favorite of the three, but the digital experience that I had was so much better. I was able to order and buy and pick it up in such a short, easy time uh, compared to the others that it made the decision really easy for us to do, and all based off of that digital experience. You know, there's Peugeot, a car company that's do, sending connected car data out to insurance vendors and others so that they can, insurance vendors can take advantage of, you know, our, our folks speeding, our folks um, standing on the brakes and being able to potentially reduce or add insurance policies based off of some real-time data. And Citibank is offering hackathons to be able to provide uh, new, their, their back-end data systems to build out new engaging applications from their partners. And some of the most, engage, the most critical apps that they have today were built leveraging that capability. And all of that was really disrupted and fueled by APIs, right? APIs truly did power everything that these folks have been doing. And if I think about overall, right, APIs, 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 and the dynamics, um, there's so much more to it. It's not just about having an API. It's really also about you know, being able to handle the dynamics and the challenges that APIs present. Your business needs to be able to handle millions of users, billions of devices that are out there today. And if your APIs can't handle that, you're not really transforming uh, your company, your business in itself. If that API that didn't have, that I wanted to order that appetizer on couldn't scale, well, then my experience is actually a lot worse than it ever was um, beforehand. You know, typical monolithic applications are slow and not able to handle the dynamic needs that are out there today. And finally, uh, you know, how do you, how do you handle the life cycle of your APIs from the creation of it to the management to the security to the retirement of the APIs? All of these things are leading us towards a shift in the programming model, and that shift is absolutely Node in itself. And Node has really emerged as the standard for APIs and microservices, really, uh, really allowing the businesses to scale to unprecedented client requests. Now, my team, I'll say, is a perfect example of that with our development of some of the offerings that we have. We had a monolithic application. We've been breaking it down into smaller microservices based off of Node, and we have seen greater scale, whether it be for our on-premise clients or even in our, more importantly, in our cloud. And even more importantly, we've gotten so much more efficient, we're writing more code, better code, by leveraging Node as the platform for our architecture. So, what, this, what that does is it leads us to this new architecture, right? And we've all seen, right, the top and understand we've got the, the systems of engagement with the web, mobile, and IoT, all the way to the bottom with our systems of record um, and the data that it possesses. And, you're, and right above that, your traditional SOA architecture, you know, fueling the connectivity to that data. But there is that new architecture that is needed, that inter an interaction services layer that is going to handle out the scale and the microservices that you need to do to handle the new digital world that we live in today. And what is needed, right, it's really designed for that microservices architecture, as I mentioned, right, non-blocking, event-driven I.O. to remain lightweight, support massive concurrency, and be able to provide the ability to have a simplified and comprehensive API lifecycle to create, manage, secure your APIs. So all of that, right, with all of that, what are some of the requirements that we have? Well, it's very simple, right? We need to invoke and scale as fast as possible, terminate after completion, right? Load balancing, self-healing, guaranteed message delivery, um, you know, want to be able to abstract developers from the infrastructure in itself, right? All of these types of things, and these are just some of those requirements that are leading us to what we see around serverless technology. And with service computing frameworks, right, when triggered by an external event, it invokes autonomous code snippets, right? And these snippets, are loosely coupled with each other that are essentially designed to perform one task at a time. Now, within IBM, we've, we've started an open project with OpenWhisk um, that is one of those serverless frameworks that allows you to perform these capabilities. And OpenWhisk does a really great job, and we're going to show you in a demo here in just a few minutes, around being able to marry some of that node technology with APIs in that serverless framework. 
So real quick, open whisk in a nutshell. Serverless deployment and operations model, where we can hide the infrastructure and operational complexity, allowing you to focus on coding. Right? Optimal utilization, flexible programming model with powerful tooling, an open ecosystem, right? key foundations of a successful uh, serverless platform. So with that, if we think about then you know, this, this integration services architecture in itself, and we have Node, and we've got OpenWhisk, or, or any of the serverless platforms, you know, it's a perfect marriage with the two of them together. Right? It's the ideal language. Node is absolutely the ideal language for our serverless environments. It's lightweight, it starts up quickly, and it's great for I.O. So I could keep talking about it, but Cy Venom from my team is here to show us a demo where he's going to be able to show how we could take an application by leveraging Node, by leveraging APIs, and open OpenWhisk to really transform and do some new engaging things. Yep. Thanks for the introduction, Andy. I'm really excited to show you guys my demo today. Uh, what we've got here is a Slack application. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Slack, pretty popular team collaboration tool. Slack apps are these uh, bots that send automated messages. What I've got here is a Slack app that I want to show you guys. Um, kind of just to set the scenario, let's imagine we have a customer feedback channel. Um, whenever a customer posts feedback on one of our products, it'll automatically get posted into this channel. The customer engagement team has been complaining that there's been way too many messages posted in this chat, and they want a way to actually prioritize the messages. So I built a Slack bot to make their lives a little bit easier. Let's take a look at what happens when some sample negative feedback gets posted. And I just pulled these off of an Amazon review. In a few seconds, OK, we get a response back, and it says uh, it's a high severity feedback. It's detected there's a, a high sense of sadness in this message and even some anger. <laughs> Seems to make sense. Um, let's see some sample positive feedback. OK, hoping it'll come back with a low severity. Demo gods, don't fail me now. <laughs> I actually can make it any bigger. Oh, there we go. There we go. It's working. We'll give it one more shot. Oh, there you go. It came back. Um, so based on that tonal analysis, it gave it a low severity. Uh, it detected that the strongest tone was joy. Uh, I sense some anger, but it's not very confident about it. So OK, uh, hopefully our customer engagement team is more equipped to respond to this feedback uh, now that they've got a severity assigned to it. Let's take a look at how, these, uh, how this Slack app was actually created. Um, I'll first start with Slack API, where I've configured the Slack app. Called it Watson. Um, I just want to show you one thing in here. It's the event that I'm subscribing to. Whenever a message is posted into this channel, uh, it says that it'll send an HTTP post request to this URL. Remember this URL. We'll come back to it in a minute. That's all I want to talk about the Slack API side for now. Let's switch to OpenWhisk. Andy quickly introduced OpenWhisk. Uh, it's basically an open source serverless computing platform. Sounds a little bit complicated, but very basically, I can host some scripts on this platform. Um, and whenever an API is called, that uh, Node.js runtime is brought up, the script is run, does what it needs to, and then brings itself all back down. Let's take a look at how easy it is to get started with OpenWhisk. Uh, I'll jump into the develop view, and I'll create an action. I'll call it uh, sample interactive. We'll choose Node 6 as the execution of runtime. We've also got Node 12, Python, Swift. Um, and we'll start with the Hello World sample that it lets me choose. Just a quick note, Node.js is perfect for serverless applications. It's lightweight, so it starts up quickly. Uh, it's asynchronous by nature, uh, which is perfect for things like our Slack bot, and uh, makes managing and calling APIs super easy. So this is a pretty simple action. All it's doing is returning the message that it gets sent. It says the code is live. Well, we didn't have to wait for it to get deployed because it's serverless. Um, it gives us a curl example. I'll go ahead and copy this and post it into my terminal. I just need to change one thing, the JSON that's getting passed in. So I'll change it to message. And hello from node interactive. OK, that's, that was really fast, actually. Um, so it called the open whisk action, which responded successfully with the message you sent me, hello from node interactive. 
And there we go. We just created our first action on a serverless platform. Jumping back, I'm going to delete that action I just created. I've already got three actions configured here for the sake of time. These are the ones that my Slack bot uses. So this is what actually goes to Watson, actually, to do the tonal analysis of the message being posted. So we've got two big pieces of the puzzle here. We've got Slack, which reads the messages being posted in this channel um, and calls some API. And we've got OpenWhisk, which is expecting to receive that API and, and run some uh, smart API calls and that kind of thing. What we need here is an API gateway in between. And what that'll do is uh, essentially massage the data coming from Slack into a format that OpenWhisk accepts. And it's going to add the right authentication headers and that kind of thing. OpenWhisk gives us a really cool command that makes it really easy to restify that action. So very simply, I'll call this whisk create API command. And in a second, it'll come back with a URL. Boom. It's deployed a gateway in front of my OpenWhisk action. Wait a second. This URL, URL looks pretty familiar. This is the same URL that we configured in Slack. It's kind of all coming together now. Let's take a quick look at that gateway that got generated when we ran that terminal command. I'm switching here to API Connect, which is our management and gateway solution uh, based on Strongloop technology, if you guys uh, recall that from previous uh, conferences. Um, and what we've got here is plain old Swagger, an open API specification. If we wanted to use this Swagger in a other offering, we could do so. But for the sake of this demo, we're using API Connect. And within API Connect, we can also see the visual representation of that Swagger. Basically, three different uh, API calls that we're managing. So quick overview. What have we seen here? Uh, we've posted a message into the Slack. Slack recognizes it, calls our API gateway. Our API gateway goes to OpenWhisk, which brings up a node runtime, goes out to the Watson APIs, does what it needs to, and then calls Slack with the tonal analysis. So our footprint is tiny, right? Uh, the compute power we're using, all we're doing is whenever a message gets posted, we bring up a uh, node runtime, run some script, and bring it back down. If no one's using the Slack bot, our footprint is zero. And as far as the API gateway goes, we are charged per API call. And I think we get 5,000 or 10,000 free API calls. Um, and it's 50,000 you get right by right going to Bluemix, I. 50,000. OK, I don't think we'll hit that anytime soon. So I'm not worried about that either. Um, so that's my demo, guys. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And Andy, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. So Sai just, just showed us real quick right, how easy it is with Node and OpenWhisk and APIs to really transform and do some new engaging apps. Uh, thanks for the time. We've got a lot of great sessions with Strongloop and our loopback capabilities and core Node. So again, thanks for your time. Uh, really appreciate it.